Hello and welcome to Noon Conference hosted by MRI Online. Noon Conference connects the global radiology community through free live educational webinars that are accessible for all and is an opportunity to learn alongside top radiologists from around the world. You can access a recording of today's conference and previous Noon Conferences by creating a free MRI Online account. Today, we are honored to welcome Dr. Mikesh Harisangani for a case review entitled MRI and Prostate Cancer, a Case-Based Approach. Dr. Harisangani completed his radiology residency and abdominal imaging subspecialty training at Massachusetts General Hospital. He's on the abdominal imaging staff at Massachusetts General Hospital, where he also specializes in body MRI and translational imaging. If you have any questions throughout the case review, please feel free to ask those using the chat. With that, we are ready to begin today's case review. Dr. Harzangani, please take it from here. Uh, so welcome, um, all the participants online. I, it's good afternoon here, but I don't know which uh, time zones you are in, but uh, a very good day to everybody. Uh, so before we start looking at the cases, I just want to take a brief moment to highlight some key points before, uh, so that you know it makes your um, read out of the uh, actual case is a little bit easier to interpret. And so when we, before you actually start looking at the MR of the prostate, it's good to be familiar with these terms. You know, what is a Gleason grade? What is the patient's PSA or prostate specific antigen level? And then uh, you should be able to calculate the PSA density, which is a, a key metric for us to um, help us increase our confidence in terms of looking at the MR and making the diagnosis. Uh, we have to be quite familiar with the anatomy of the gland. Uh, you know, which, what are the different zones? Uh, what are some of the uh, key anatomic aspects that one needs to keep in mind when one is looking at the, uh, the MRs in terms of lesion detection? Uh, what are the various components of the multiparametric MR? I know there is a, a big push uh, for not giving gadolinium and just doing what is referred to as a biparametric MR. And I think if you are experienced and are able to do that, uh, certainly it's a desirable attribute. But for a lot of other centers where uh, there is a wide range of expertise and experience, they, the preference is still to use uh, gadolinium and do multiparametric MR. And then lastly, obviously, are you answering the clinical question at hand? which in most cases is detection of clinically significant cancer so that they can target the appropriate area. But sometimes they also want to know information above and beyond, which is staging of the lesion, et cetera. So, so these are some key comp components that. So uh, in terms of Gleason um, score, uh, it, it's a uh, sort of pathology um, derived um, a metric by which the pathologist looking at the uh, uh, slides under the microscope ascribe a score in terms of how deviant is the, um, uh, is the lesion from a normal appearing gland. And it turns out that um, when they look at it under the microscope, they see which is the first most common pattern and they give it a score from one to five. And then they find which is the, the second sort of pattern and give it a score of one to five and they add those two. So the least score that somebody can get is a Gleason of six and those are the the relatively indolent tumors. And the classic adage is these patients typically die with the cancer rather than from the cancer. Once you start seeing um, a grade group uh, four, uh, then obviously the total goes above six and becomes seven. So three plus four is one, you know, seven and four plus three. And, and this is the only time, you know, where you sort of go against the rule of mathematics where uh, three plus four is where the dominant pattern is three is slightly better outcome than four plus three, where the dominant pattern is four. And precisely for this reason, the International Society of Europathologists now uh, have devised a new terminology, which is called, called grade, grade group. So grade group one is Gleason six. Grade group two is a Gleason seven, but it's three plus four. And grade group three is a Gleason seven, but here the dominant pattern is four plus three. And as you can see, as you have grade group four, which is a Gleason score of eight, four plus four, um, yeah, or, or these combinations and, and, and a grade group five. So these are typically the higher grade uh, cancer. And so if you were to uh, ask um, or be asked, what is the definition of a clinically significant cancer? It's important to understand that those are tumors where uh, 
the Gleason score is seven or above. So the classic definition is Gleason score of greater than or equal to seven or ESUB grade of greater than or equal to two with a volume of more than 0.5 cc and, and presence or absence of extra prostatic extension. So the, the it's important to understand, you know, the this definition of quote unquote clinically significant cancer, uh, which translates to looking at the ESUB grade or the Gleason score. So that's the first point. The second thing is it's also important to know the T staging a little bit because um, you don't have to put this in your report, but it's good to sort of uh, get a sense of what it is. And so T1 is when the tumor is not felt by the digital rectal exam, it's present. Uh, T2 is when the tumor is present in the gland is and is confined to the gland, but is, but is felt by a digital rectal exam. And this is now broken up into three categories where T2A is when it is less than 50% of, of, of one side. B is when it's more than 50% of uh, still confined to one side. T2C is when it's bilateral uh, extension of the, um, the tumor. And then obviously when the tumor gets beyond the gland, it goes into the capsule, that's T3A, and it extends into the seminal vesicles, that is T3B. And finally, we have uh, T4 disease that spreads beyond the um, uh, the gland into you know adjacent organs like the bladder or it goes and involves the rectum etc so that's sort of in a nutshell the the t staging now based on the t staging and the uh, gleason grade group um, you will see in your urologist or radiation oncologist notes this sort of risk stratification and basically all it is is a combining the patient's psa level the gleason score and what they feel is a clinical stage and they ascribe a risk category of low intermediate, high, or very high. And this is basically the risk of having distant metastasis. So again, just you don't have to memorize it. You just have to be aware that these terminologies uh, exist for you to understand better what are the, um, uh, what, what are the char characteristics of the tumor that uh, one needs to be aware of. Now that comes to PSA density. This is uh, one value which um, it's important. Now, if you Think about the average age of the patients that we scan looking for prostate cancer. These patients typically have BPH. And one of the, as the gland expands, because there is increase in the glandular volume, there is going to be increased production of PSA. So elevation of the PSA does not necessarily equal to tumor. And that is why when you equate that or calibrate that to the patient's gland volume, you'll get a better sense of what the, um, uh, the risk factor for tumor is. So this is something that you should routinely do in your or put in your report if it hasn't been already done for you because you will know the patient's PSA value. And so the formula is of the PSA density is the PSA value that you have the most recent value of and that divided by the prostatic volume. Uh, prostatic volume, we can very easily calculate an MR. It's either auto-segmented in you know if you have certain software or if you don't have that, it's very easy to calculate where you take the three maximal dimensions. So here it is the superior to inferior, anterior to posterior, and right to left or transverse dimension, and multiply that by 0 0.52, and that gives you the prosthetic volume. So if you put in the PSA value in the numerator, the prosthetic volume in the denominator, looking at that, the cutoff is 0.15. Typically, if you have values about above 0.15, that tells you that Besides the glandular volume contributing to PSA, there may be something else that is probably contributing. And so the way to use this is if you have a uh, PSA density of more than 0.15, then you better look hard uh, throughout the gland to make sure that you're not missing a tumor. It can also help you when you have a pyrat 3 lesion. And if you're one of those institutions where you don't typically biopsy those, you know, you can, it may be one, um, indication of swaying your um, your uh, biopsy colleagues to uh, to biopsy the lesion. So that's sort of another uh, use and this, therefore it's a very important value to incorporate in your report. And, and this is just to show that you know using a combination of PSA density and pyrites both you get a higher accuracy of uh, detecting uh, clinically significant cancers and there's ample body of literature that supports uh, this sort of a approach where you combine the PSA density with uh, what you see on imaging. So these are the various components of the multi-parametric MR. You start with the localizer, and then we have the triplane T2s. The triplane T2s are primarily for anatomic delineation, knowing the zones of the, the prostate and lesion detection, primarily in the transition zone. 
We do a large field of view going all the way from aortic bifurcation to the pubic symphysis. And the reason for doing that is to assess for lymph nodes and also surrounding organ because they can have incidental findings and, and looking at that. Then we do DWI where you do a um, uh, low B value and intermediate B value, calculate an ADC from that. And the ADC basically is a slope. Once you know the ADC, you can then extrapolate higher B values. So you get a calculated B value. At our institution, we do a B calculated B value of 2000, uh, which typically is adequate for suppressing the entire norm normal gland and bringing out the uh, tumor, as you see in this case in the, uh, uh, in the right uh, mid-posterior peripheral zone. And then finally, um, the dynamics, which are done to complement lesion detection primarily in the peripheral zone. And the goal is to uh, utilize the, um, uh, the vascular feature of the tumor where the tumor enhances early and washes out relatively early. And so you have to have sort of high temporal resolution after you give gadolinium to look for differential enhancement of the lesion compared to, comparing it to the rest of the gland. So those are the components of the multiparametric uh, MR. Uh, just a brief mention about anatomy. And so the prostate basically, um, before we uh, jump into the zones, is divided into three distinct uh, areas. The part of the gland which is, uh, or the third of the gland that is closer to the bladder is referred to as the proximal uh, third or the base. Um, and the furthest part of the gland is referred to as the apex. And therefore you divide the gland into thirds. So we have the, the proximal third, which is the base, the mid third and the apical part or the distal third of the gland. And then after you have this sort of uh, thirds, you kind of look at the zones. Now there are four distinct zones in the prostate. The two areas that we commonly expect tumors to arise in is the peripheral zone, where you can see on the axial uh, diagrammatic depiction and the SAGE di diagrammatic depiction. And then we have the other area where tumors typically arise, which is the transition zone. In addition to that, we have two other areas. We have the anterior fibromuscular stroma, which has no glandular element, so tumors should not arise here. Typically, when you have lesions that extend into this location, they're either coming from the transition or they're coming from the peripheral zone. And lastly, we have the central zone, which is an important uh, uh, anatomic point to keep in mind because this can be dark on T2 and show restricted diffusion. And it is typically because this transition zone is enlarged in these patient uh, age uh, cohorts, the central zone is pushed superior laterally towards the seminal vesicles. Um, and so you need to know where it is located. The point also is that on axial images, it can fuse in the midline and come down up to the level of the Vero Montana. So this is what the anatomy, anatomy looks like on MR. So you can see the peripheral zone is bright on T2. This is the sort of the transition zone um, which is symmetric in this case with the anterior fibromuscular stroma being dark on T2. And this is what it looks like on the, on the sagittal image. Um, so that was about anatomy. Now, when in terms of localization, when you look at the pyrides documentation, it sort of has this very elegant segmentation into um, you know, multiple different areas and they have terminologies. Uh, again, it depends on an institutional preference at our place, we prefer to keep it simple. So what we do is we first start whether it's right versus left. Then we talk about anterior versus posterior and the dividing line is an arbitrary line you know, through the center of the gland. Then we talk about whether it's in the base, mid or apex, and then we put it in the relevant uh, uh, location in terms of the um, zonal anatomy. So if you follow this every single time, you know, it becomes easy to describe and also sort of mention. So for example, if you have something like this, you will say this is on in the right posterior mid peripheral zone of the gland. And sort of that's how you will, if it's something on the other side, you will say left mid posterior uh, uh, peripheral zone. So you always follow the same sort of um, uh, pattern of localization and that helps you in terms of accurately localizing where the tumor is. So this, as I said, this would be right posterior mid gland PZ lesion with no extra capsular extension. That would be your description for, for this uh, specific lesion. And then the last two slides, you know, just it's good to have these kind of cheat sheets in your reading room. We have one, um, you know, which kind of just helps us when uh, there is a confusion in terms of what the algorithm says. Uh, this one nicely goes through the peripheral and the transition zone. So having something like that is very uh, helpful to, uh, you know, to uh, 
provide um, consistency in your reads. So that was sort of in a nutshell, just some basics. Now we'll stop this slideshow and go into the cases. So we start with our first case. This is a, um, let me just bring up the case. List. So yeah, so this first case is a 63 year old gentleman. Uh, his PSA is 7.8 and his PSA density is 0 0.18. So clearly it's more than 0 0.15. Uh, and, you know, obviously there is uh, the urologist felt something on the right side. And so they send the patient for an MR before the patient is proceeding for a biopsy to see if we find something that they can target with the biopsy. So as I mentioned, we do triplane T2. So we start with the localizer. So this is the localizer and kind of just, um, it's also a good um, uh, check for the technologist to know that they are covering the relevant anatomy and there is adequate signal. Um, you know, we don't use endorectal call in our practice, so we rely on the high uh, fidelity of the phased, phased array coils. And so when they look at this scout, you know that there is good signal anterior and posteriorly, and the channels in the coils are working well. You'll be surprised how many times that with these phased array coils, if one of the channels is, you know, malfunctioning, you may see a signal loss in certain areas of the um, scout and, and you know, the technologies then can stop right there and 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 start uh, thinking about you know what's going on and then as i said we do a wide field of ut2 and this goes all the way from the aortic bifurcation down so as you can see right here we are we are coming up to the aortic bifurcation going down uh, up to the level of the uh, pubic symphysis and so just looking at this case what you see is um, that there is a obviously there's something arising from the bladder in the midline in the post anterior superior aspect but um, let's now proceed to the uh, here's the sag the axial and the coronal now what i usually do is i bring the triplane together and also try and bring up the t1 um pre um which right here so i quickly take a look at the t1 pre and and the goal is just to make sure that there is no hemorrhage um, if you see anything that is T1 bright in the gland, uh, obviously the majority of the patients that come to us now come before biopsy. So it's going to be exceedingly uncommon to see hemorrhage in the gland. But there are times when, you know, there are patients who are on anticoagulants or uh, you can sometimes have a little bit of spontaneous hemorrhage. So it's good to sort of know that and at least be wary that those areas can have relatively uh, uh, low signal intensity on T2. And so now when you look at the axial, uh, as you can see, um, as I'm scrolling through, when you look at the uh, corresponding uh, plane on the sagittal, it is a straight axial. Uh, and one can put pose the question is, uh, do we typically do a straight axial or do we angle it to the prostate? Uh, so just to kind of lay it out, um, if you end up, uh, there are two things to keep in mind when you are angling uh, the axial to the prostate gland. One is, Obviously, you have to then be familiar with the anatomic uh, uh, distortion, if you will. Second is, if you end up doing your axial or a transverse in that uh, oblique plane, then you also need to make sure that your enhanced images and your DWI are also in the same plane. Because if they are not, you know, it will be sometimes very difficult to precisely localize where you're seeing and, and cross-correlating. Uh, you know, with modern day packs, you can have the cursor co-localize but it still makes it easier if sort of the, the planes of all the three transfers are in the same oblique plane. Um, the, other interest in, uh, the other point to keep in mind is, you know, you, if I ask you what would be the oblique plane here, uh, if one uses the analogy of, say, rectal cancer, it has to be perpendicular to the tumor. So one starts thinking, well, we need to be perpendicular to the gland. The problem is when you do that, and if I kind of just draw a line uh, in terms of making that, you'll see that uh, this is perpendicular to the gland, but this axial, axial plane is going to have, as we go down, you'll see that there'll be parts of the peripheral zone which are mid, but you're anteriorly, you're seeing more of the apex. So uh, you have to be a little bit careful. That's what I meant by distortion of the anatomy. And the other in, um, important thing to keep in mind is that when you're actually doing the perpendicular plane, you have to do it to the plane of the, um, uh, the peripheral zone, not to the gland. So you will kind of outline the peripheral zone and be perpendicular to the uh, peripheral zone, not to the gland itself. So that's something else to keep in mind in terms of uh, doing your uh, obliquities. Uh, 
So in this case, as you are scrolling through, you, right, as you're just looking at the anatomy, this is the, uh, the peripheral zone. Here is the transition zone, the seminal vesicles, and this triangular area that you see, and I'm going to bring up the, uh, let's see if I can magnify this to show you, bring up the, um, uh, the coronal and the, um, so you, So if I can cross correlate that, you'll see that this triangular area corresponds to this low density or low signal intensity area at the base in the gland, which is bilaterally symmetric. And it's this sort of tear shaped area bilaterally, which is symmetric and is dark. So that is the central zone. And you have to be familiar with this anatomy, as I said, because you know these can appear dark and mimic a lesion. Plus if I bring up the diffusion, the high B value DWI, which, uh, Right here, you can see that you know these areas can sometimes show bright signal on the on the diffusion or dark signal on the ADC, depending on which one are you looking at. And so, yeah, just be wary that that's where the central zone is. So now, as we scroll through, you see that there is this ill-defined area in the left mid uh, posterior peripheral zone, which is clearly dark on the ADC, and um, as we look at the gadolinium enhanced images, you can see that there clearly is early enhancement in that um, in that lesion. And so um, the question now is, you know, it's sort of localized uh, margins are ill-defined, and you you know its location. You can see that it's showing all the classic features. It has restricted diffusion. It has T uh, two dark signal showing early enhancement. Uh, doesn't look like there is, you know, the capsule is nicely delineated. Um, there's a little bit of dark signal here, but don't see much going extending beyond that. So, um, and obviously we will have to now measure. Now, the question is, um, where do you measure? And, you know, there are uh, certain stipulations by the pyrites documentation. You can follow that. I would say measure it where you see it best. And you, we usually try and measure it in two different planes to kind of get a sense and then give them the maximum dimension. So in this case, it would be something like 1.4 to, on this side, it measures about one centimeter. So it'll be around 1.4 centimeters that you're seeing. And so if you go by the classic pyrides uh, uh, 2.1 uh, descriptions in the peripheral zone, this is less than 1.5. We don't see any obvious extra capsular extension. So this would be a pyrides 4. Uh, and you would mark the lesion for them to um, uh, to uh, uh, to sample. Now it turns out that um, this was uh, targeted, and this came back as a grade group four or a four plus four um, lesion. So obviously that put him in a high risk category for metastases, and this patient ended up getting a uh, PSMA scan. And this is the patient's PSMA scan. To show you the fusion. Um, and as we scroll down, we don't see any abnormal uptake in the bones. And don't see any. These are the ureters that you see uh, with typical excretion. And as we come down again, that's the ureter. Uh, you will see that that lesion does show increased um, PSMA uptake and nothing beyond the gland in terms of uh, metastasis. So uh, that's how he was staged and then appropriately treated with that. Uh, you know, with that uh, uh, staging information. So just a nice example of a peripheral zone and going over some anatomy, et cetera. Now, moving on to the second case, this is a patient who is, um, again, uh, somewhat 60-year-old, uh, comes in with a PSA value of um, uh, 4.8, and the PSA uh, density here is 0 0.07. So PSA density is not very high. And um, the question is, um, uh, you know, when, when the P, will you still see, and what do you do if the PSA density is low? So, as I mentioned earlier, it's when the PSA density is high, you are going to, you know, look very hard and make sure that there is no lesion. If the PSA density is not very high, you still are going to follow the same pyrite scheme and call. It's not that you will not call. So, the value of PSA density is when it is high, not you know when it is below the 0.15. If you see uh, a frank pyrites lesion, you will then end up calling that lesion. So just keep that in mind. That's why 
I, I mentioned the, the value here. So now again, same thing, looking at the, um, uh, the uh, sorry, somebody has put a question, is PET good assessment of uptake in prostate cancer, METs and primary lesions? So I think the, yeah. you know, this has been studied and uh, it clearly there is a, there is no um, question about the utility in looking for metastases. As far as looking at primary lesion, I think, um, the MR definitely does better in terms of detecting because the problem with PSMA is you can have false positives and you can also have false negatives. And then that begs the question is, you know, where, uh, how do you then triage those patients? So it's still desirable to do MR. Obviously, you, you know, you're not giving any radiation. That's a clear advantage and benefit. And, this, and the third thing is uh, the precise uh, uh, location, anatomic location becomes critical uh, in terms of you know where it is localized and that and that clearly is much better done with MR than with uh, PSM, PSMA PET. Now one could make the argument is can you do a uh, MR PET? And now that those instruments or scanners are not uh, ubiquitously av available, so I think uh, you know that question is sort of uh, uh, not relevant in a sense. So for practical purposes for primary lesion, you still want to do the MR for looking at distant metastases. It's uh, PSMA. All right, so let's look at the, um, the triplane here. And so um, starting, and uh, let's bring up the T1. Test images, oh, that's actually post. Let's see if I can bring up the dynamics, here we go. Um, so again, you know, there are certain tiny, as I mentioned earlier, you may see occasionally some little bit of bright foci, um, you know, that does happen sometimes with these degenerating um, BPH nodules or even in the peripheral zone spontaneously, you can have some punctate hemorrhage, uh, nothing to be alarmed about, but nothing uh, overtly abnormal here. So let's look at the axial now and... Um, this annotation. Going from the base to the apex. Um, so as you can see, in, as compared to the prior case, in this case, um, there is a fair amount of BPH. Now, uh, BPH uh, comes in two flavors, or rather three flavors. Uh, what we call as a typical hyperplastic nodule that is bright on T2. And then we can have stromal components, which are dark on T2. And then you have the mixed variety of or where you have both stromal and hyperplastic components. The goal is to have uh, to make sure that there are lesions that are very well circumscribed or have a very clear defined capsule because that uh, tells you that this is um, BPH rather than something that you need to be um, uh, concerned about. And so clearly now in this case the enlarging transition zone is, is uh, pushing the peripheral zone or ca causing the peripheral zone to be um, you know uh, compressed, if you will. And on the left side, you can nicely see the uh, mixed signal intensity where you have bright and dark areas, which is typical in these cases where patients have had prior episodes of inflammation. And so again, just going back to, um, uh, to let's get rid of this. Going back to the um, SAG, and as you will see here in this case, um, semi-anal vesicle, and in that area on the, the, we go to the left side first. So this is the uh, peripheral zone on the left side where you can nicely see the C-shaped uh, bright signal. And when I go to the contralateral side, you can see that right from the base, almost reaching up to the apex, which you are also seeing right here, that there is a um, a uh, dark signal or a dark area. And on the coronal also, you can nicely, if I cross correlate this location, you will see that it's sort of spanning all the way from base, uh, almost reaching to the apex of the um, uh, apex of the gland. And so that's um, uh, sort of clearly concerning. Now the question is, uh, how does this span out on the high B value? So let's look at it on the high B value. So you can clearly see that there is bright signal 
So I window it. Asymmetric bright signal on that side. Plus, in addition to that, there are some interesting features here. So if you look on the left side, this is the outline of the capsule. Uh, here is the rectum, and this angle that you see is referred to as a rectoprostatic angle right there. Um, if I was to, uh, let's see if I can take a pencil and draw it. So it's this angle would be the rectoprostatic angle. But on the other side, you can see that that rectoprostatic angle is obliterated with clearly the same soft tissue density that you're seeing in the peripheral zone extending into and, and causing blunting of the rectoprostatic angle. So clearly there is tissue going beyond. So this clearly is uh, concerning for extraprostatic extension. There is restricted diffusion. And if we also look at the uh, gadolinium enhanced images, as we go through the temporal phases, you will see that there is early enhancement and that also is getting beyond the, um, uh, the outline of the gland. So that clearly is extracapsular extension. And so this was sampled and this came back as a Gleason pattern three plus four. Uh, so Gleason seven uh, with extracapsular extension. So this clearly is a, is a, you know, it puts the patient into higher grade uh, the other important thing is they want to know about this is because, uh, as you know, one of the definitive therapies they give patients uh, or patients opt instead of surgery, they may want to get radiation therapy. And if they have to do radiation therapy, what they don't want to do is unnecessary um, radiation of the rectal wall, which here is closely applied. So what they do is they put a biologically inert uh, gel which is called a space or that's the commercial name. It basically is a biologically inert gel in between the rectum and the prostate. And if they have to do that, they have to know this anatomic configuration because they go transperineally to install the gel. And if there is a certain bulkiness of the disease, they don't, they are not able to adequately dissect or get a clear plane. And that can sometimes lead to adverse uh, complications where the gel may actually be misplaced in the rectal wall rather than in this potential space. So this is, again, important information to communicate, not only from a prognostic um, factor, but also if they are planning treatment, it may affect what they want to do in terms of uh, installing the, uh, the gel. So this was, again, a peripheral zone with extra capsular extension, and this patient that did have... Um, um, uh, did have... Uh, uh, it did have a low PSA density, and despite that, had a lesion and a and a extracapsular extension. So that's uh, this patient. Now we're moving on to the next patient, which is uh, a 65 year old uh, with a PSA of 20.9. So let me just bring up that case. Uh, and this patient. Um, uh, had a PA, also had an elevated PSA density above 0.15. And so again, um, the urologist who did the digital rectal exam felt something bilaterally, but was not sure. But given the high PSA and the high PSA density, obviously they wanted to get the MR before. Uh, so let's look at the, um, uh, the axial to begin with. You can see that there is a little bit of free fluid in the peritoneum. And, you know, this is, um, men should typically you know, they don't typically have free fluid in the peritoneal lining, but occasionally you do see that. And one of the common um, entities that we see is some kind of bowel, you know, inflammation or pathology higher up that can sometimes contribute to that, or there's some non-specific inflammatory thing going on. Um, so that may be one factor that this patient has uh, free fluid. So as you come down, you can see we are entering into the, um, uh, or getting into the prostate from the base. You can see the bladder is thickened, which is not unexpected. That, that means there is bladder outlet obstruction. But as we come into the, the prostate itself, um, let me bring up the coronal and the sagittal so you can see them side by side. So here's the coronal and this is the sagittal. So now there are, um, this uh, is a, uh, protocol that was not done at our institution. Um, so there are some uh, institutions where what they do is, instead of doing all the three planes as a classic turbo spin echo or a fast spin echo, they usually do one plane as a single shot fast spin echo. The reason we don't like that is because, um, as you can see on this uh, single shot uh, or a haze sequence, that uh, 
the contrast to noise is blunted. It's not as good as you see on the axial and coronal. And so despite its, um, its speed and relative lack of motion, the, um, the contrast to noise is not as good. And now with the current uh, uh, way of acquisition or doing uh, the turbo spin echo or fast spin echo with um, what is referred to as deep learning or DL-based uh, sequences, these take very little time. In fact, our entire prostate protocol, including the dynamic enhancement, is only about 15 minutes. And so there is really no need to dilute the protocol by doing this. But again, you know, it depends on various other circumstances. So I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm just telling you what you will lose if you end up doing one of the planes. And, and it can sometimes be a challenge in terms, of, especially when you're looking at transition zone, which is the case in this patient. So when you look at the peripheral zone, it's bilaterally symmetric. But look, when you come to the transition zone, what you see here is this sort of area. Now, when do you start getting concern in the transition zone? You start getting concern in the transition zone when you either have an interrupted capsule. And what do I mean by that is that if you think about um, uh, a BPH neural, and the green line here refers to the capsule, so you want to see a complete capsule. That's what you want a BPH neural to have. If you have something like this, which is interrupted, but it's still present, um, then you look at the diffusion. If there is restricted diffusion, then you start worrying about it. And then if you don't have a capsule at all, whether it's interrupted or complete, that's when you start worrying. Now, if you don't have a capsule, then what you do is you look in the inside of the lesion. If the inside of the lesion is showing heterogeneity, then you have to look at the diffusion. But if it is relatively homogeneous, as you're seeing in this case, then all you do is look at the size of the lesion. So in this case, looking in all the three planes, if I cross correlate this area, you will see clearly that this lesion, no matter how I, which plane I'm looking at, I'm not seeing either a complete or an interrupted capsule, which means I'm already at a pyrite three or higher in the transition zone. And then when I look at the inside of the lesion, I think it's relatively homogeneous. Again, looking at all the other planes, that's what you can see on the, on the, on the sagittal, on the, on the coronal, on the axial, it is relatively homogeneous. And if it's relatively homogeneous, that means it's either a pyrite four or a five, and that's based on size. And if you look at the size in this case, it's going to be approximately, you know, two centimeters, which is more than a uh, 1.5. So it's a pyrite five lesion in the, uh, in the uh, transition zone. The other interesting thing is, in, in this lesion is, um, Remember we spoke about, um, so here, this dark signal that you see, right? Uh, actually, let me just bring up the DWI as well. Although not, they, they ask you, it's not the dominant sequence. It's always good to also look at it when you are. Uh, yes, so there you go. This is the high B value calculated. Let me just window it. And let's close this one out and make this a little bit larger. Okay, so now as you look here, you can see that this dark area right here is the anterior fibromuscular stroma. And if I cross correlate that, you will see where that corresponds. There is no restricted diffusion. On the other side, I am not seeing this signal, which means this uh, abnormality that is present in the transition zone is also extending into the anterior fibromuscular stromal region on the left, because you don't see that uh, dark signal anymore as you can see, as I as I point to the outer margin of this, it is where you see the restricted diffusion. So uh, it clearly is involving the anterior fibromuscular stromal region, which again is important for them to know about because that is going to factor into how they uh, do the wrist, strat uh, wrist stratification. So again, a large lesion in the transition zone showing restricted diffusion. And um, uh, this came back as a, on, on the fusion biopsy, this came back as a Gleason 4 plus 4 in the anterior um, mid transition zone. So that's what it was. And so this is one that is extending into the fibromuscular um, spromal region. Okay, so then we move on to the next case, which is So this is a case patient who um, initially had a 
see if I have the right exam. Uh, has an elevated PSA, and the uh, urologist felt something on the uh, right side. And so the patient was sent for um, a pre-biopsy MR. And uh, the uh, PSA density was less than 0.15. Uh, so it was not uh, above the cutoff value. Now, as you look at the axial image here, you can see that Clearly, there is a the left side is nice and pristine. The right side is nice and coming closer to the midline in the right mid posterior. There seems to be a bulge, and there is a T2 dark signal that is seen. Um, and here is the calculated B value. Now, if you look very closely at if I window this well, there is mild asymmetry, but compared to the left side, but it is not as restricting as some of the other cases we saw early on. So now let's look at the enhanced images. And as I go through the... So here's the early enhanced uh, arterial sort of early arterial phase. And you'll see that compared to some of the other earlier cases we saw, which were you know, lesions that had classically read the textbook, uh, this one does not show much early enhancement. And so let's look at the ADC as well. So there is a little bit of asymmetry. And so this is what one would put in the pyrad three category, right? Where there is some dark signal on, on the ADC, uh, which is asymmetric, but correspondingly, you don't see a lot of bright signal on the DWI, high B, high B value DWI. And clearly there is no early enhancement. If it was, uh, presenting like this and did show early enhancement, then it would bump it up to a pyrides 4. Um, but in this case, it's a pyrides 3. Now, at our institution, we mark everything pyrides 3 and above. And so this was clearly uh, something that um, uh, looks very sinister on T2, uh, does not have the kind of diffusion you would expect um, to see uh, with a lesion of this size and, 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 and you know, this uh, sort of appearance. And clearly, there is no early enhancement. And so this was a pyrite 3 lesion, which was marked. And the, uh, the lesion was targeted successfully. And the target, targeted biopsy came back negative. And this patient ended up getting a follow-up MR. So this is done in the year 2020. And there is a follow-up MR in uh, 2023. Uh, so let me just see if I can... Open that in a new window, okay? And so I'll just bring it up here so you can actually see the... Uh, so here's the old T2, and I'm going to show you the T2 in 2023. Same patient. And you can see that in that location, that thing, that, that area has totally cleared up. And so... Why am I showing you this case? I'm showing you this case. He actually has a slight um, herniated BPH nodule on the left side. As you can see, it is contiguous with the surgical capsule, very sharply demarcated there. Um, the reason I'm showing you is that um, this is one manifestation of you know, post-inflammatory findings where, and they are reversible as you're seeing in this case. And they can look quite sinister on T2. It looks almost like an aggressive looking lesion with a capsular bulge. Uh, but then what was, um, uh, what did tell us uh, uh, or what tempered our T2-weighted appearance was looking at the diffusion and relative lack of early enhancement for the size of the lesion. Uh, but anyway, the right thing was done. You still follow the algorithm. It, it, fall, it fits the pyrides 3 category. And this was, uh, uh, pyrides 3 category was biopsied, was negative and has subsequently cleared up. So this is a classic example of a false positive on T2. Uh, so, you know, again, make sure you look at all the sequences, make sure that you are uh, adequately sort of correlating the information from all the uh, sequences to, uh, to, to make the diagnosis. So that's, um, uh, so moving on to the next case. So this is a, again, a 60 somewhat year old patient. Let me just bring that up just a second. And uh, patient 
a uh, PSA level of um, 3.7 and a PSA density of 0 0.11. And so not, not very high PSA density. Uh, it's less than 0.15 in the P but the, the, um, the primary care physician who was, you know, examining the patient was very adamant that they felt something very uh, hard on the left side. And so they referred the patient for MR. And so let's start with the axial T2 again. So as you can see on the axial T2 here that there is bright signal, expected bright signal on the right side. Uh, you know, the transition zone is not very large uh, and it has that sort of bilateral symmetric appearance that we are expected to see. And in addition to that, what you're seeing here is um, the entire lobe, uh, left lobe of the peripheral zone is dark. And within that left lobe, there is an area that appears relatively more dark. So clearly there's something going on there. And let's now um, uh, look at it on the coronal and the diffusion. So let's see, maybe I'm missing the, so let's see the SAG. If I cross correlate it, you'll see that that's the entire peripheral zone abnormal side and going to the normal side, you have normal signal there. And now let's see the enhanced images and the TWI. So, sorry, I'm trying to bring up the correct. Uh, yeah, so here is the ADC. And let me just window it a little bit. So, as you can see, that on the left side, the entire peripheral zone is abnormal. But remember, if you be saw on the axial T2, as you can see, on the axial T2 that there was a more focal area of dark signal and that's also appears a little bit more darker on the ADC compared to the entire other left peripheral zone. Plus when you look at the enhancement, you will see that that's this area which is more dark on uh, the uh, ADC shows what looks like a ring-like enhancement on the, uh, and plus the entire peripheral zone is also enhancing early, but that area is showing uh, lack of enhancement and almost looks like an abscess. And so when you see this ring-like enhancement with this low bar uh, change on the DWI along with sort of low bar enhancement, you start thinking about, you know, tumor typically most acinar adenocarcinoma, the, the most common type of adenocarcinoma as we see in the prostate, they don't typically cause this kind of rim-like enhancement. When you see like that appearance and you start thinking about, is there some kind of a history here that we have not been provided? And on probing and biopsying the patient's chart, what we found was this patient actually had bladder cancer uh, and, and had been given BCG um, uh, a few months earlier for treatment of the superficial bladder cancer. And so uh, this was sampled. This came back as chronic uh, granulomatous prostatitis. So this is a post-BCG prostatitis, and this is what it looks like. Uh, typically, it has this sort of ring-like ring enhancement, um, which you know tumors don't typically show that. And so just be wary, you know, look at the history. I mean, again, looking on the T2 and the, and the, um, and if you were doing just a biparametric approach, you can imagine that, you know, one could uh, easily confuse this for a uh, aggressive looking cancer. It's the ring enhancement that sort of helps you um, accurately, you know, put it into the right context. And obviously you need the correct clinical history to go along with that. So, so this is a, uh, a good example of uh, uh, of a chronic granulomatous uh, prostatitis. Um, okay, moving on to the next case. This is a, let's bring it up one second. So this is a patient who is 70 year old and comes in uh, with a, uh, uh, slightly elevated PSA. His PSA density is not very high. It's 0.08. And um, the um, again, something was felt digitally. And so the patient was referred. So let's start with the axial 
uh, let's take a look at the uh, T1 also before we start. So this is the free contrast T1. And as, I'm sorry, that's, she so see Gadolinium here. So that's delayed. Let me bring up the early. Let's see if this is it. Yeah, so this is the early sort of run before giving, I guess this must have been a slight test bolus. That's what it's there. But this is the pre-contrast run. And you can see that in this case, there is bright signal in the peripheral zone bilaterally. And you can see that there is, um, and, and the reason this happens is, you know, we used to see this more commonly when, you know, before uh, sort of the uh, advent of uh, using multiparametric MR to guide the biopsy. Um, but, uh, and so we used to see this a lot. And the reason why you see hemorrhage is because the prostatic secretions, they contain citrate or citrate. And citrate is a naturally occurring anticoagulant. It's also present in pleural fluid and some of the other fluids. So that prevents blood from clotting. And so hemorrhage can stay for a longer time um, before, um, you know, before it gets uh, resolved with the, uh, uh, after, after the biopsy. Uh, but here, in this case, the patient has not had a biopsy. This is spontaneous bleed. The patient is 71, is an on, has some cardiac issues, and therefore is on anticoagulation. And this is what I was referring to. Now, this can sometimes be a helpful thing for you because there is a uh, uh, not very sensitive, but quite a specific sign, which is referred to as a hemorrhagic um, exclusion sign. And so if you look there, you know, there is involvement, but there is a certain area on the right side where you don't see hemorrhage. And now remember, uh, I said the uh, uh, normal prostate contains, or prostatic uh, ex uh, secretions contain citrate. If you have tumor that replaces the normal prostate and that part of the gland does not secrete the normal secretions. And so that area will not have the citrate and blood may not stay there for a long duration. That's sort of the underlying premise for the hemorrhage exclusion sign. And so you can see in this case that there is dark signal there on the right side where there is no hemorrhage on the, um, on the pre-contrast T1. So let's look at the uh, DWI to see what's going on in that location. So this is the high B value, that's the ADC. And let me just window this a little bit better. And so as we come down to that location, you will see that that area where there is lack of hemorrhage, T2 dark signal, there clearly is bright DWI and dark ADC. So there clearly is restricted diffusion. And then just to see what it's doing on the... Uh, enhanced sequences. For which you will need subtraction because obviously there is bright. So we'll take a look at the subtractions. You can see that there is early enhancement in that location on the subtraction, which nicely corresponds to. Um, so again, uh, a useful sign that may help you out. This is a hemorrhage exclusion sign, um, which clearly showing restricted diffusion. Uh, one other point to keep in mind is, you know, there used to, when our high B values were not um, quite this high, uh, you know, even till about uh, a decade ago when we were doing MRs, you know, our typical B values were in the range of, um, you know, 800, uh, the highest B value, 800 to 1000. Uh, and we used to rely more on the ADCs in terms of dark signal than the high B value. Now with the high B values being close to two, close to 2000 or even 2500 in some instances, uh, you know, this confounding issue of um, hemorrhage causing uh, problems is, is less of an issue. So, you know, you can clearly see through some uh, hemorrhage within the peripheral zone and can actually identify the, um, uh, the tumor nicely. And so the, the take home here is also, if you end up doing a DC, make sure you do subtractions, which you always should do when you, whenever you give gadolinium. Uh, you can nicely see the lesions against the backdrop of bright signal, and there clearly is uh, restricted uh, diffusion here. So I think I'll stop there because it's 12.54, but uh, I would like to take the um, uh, opportunity to answer some of the questions that have been raised in the, um, the Q&A, and let me see if there's anything in the... Uh, so somebody has said, would it be a good idea to use clocks for location of the lesion? So uh, that's an interesting, just like we do in our fistulas. Um, obviously, the, the problem there is, you know, the reason we use a clock is because in fistulas, that's how the surgeons also foresee their surgical field. So it becomes uh, 
easy to correlate. The urologists are not doing it that way because it depends on how they do the biopsy. You know, most of our biopsies are done transperineally, which is not exactly the way we are looking at it. So it would not serve any purpose in terms of directly or directing them, whereas the description actually gives them an idea as to where it is. So that may be a useful uh, is to follow the way I describe rather than doing a clock face. So let's see what some of the... Um, uh, why do you call that early enhancement? Well, so I think, I don't know which case they, um, they are referring to, but... Uh, the question is, when do you call it? I, you know, we used to in years past do quantitative metrics of looking at, you know, certain maps for uh, uh, comparing the area that is in question and comparing it that to the arterial input or femoral arterial input function. We don't do that anymore. It's all qualitative assessment. So what you're doing is you're doing two things. One is you can do a rough region of interest on that area and you can temporarily plot the uh, time intensity curve on your packs compare that to the contralateral or normal side, uh, as well as compare that to the artery. So that gives you a good frame of reference as to whether the lesion is enhancing early or not. Uh, so sometimes, you know, just visually looking, you may not be able to make the assessment. Doing this quick um, assessment on packs where you do, draw a region of interest and do a time intensity curve, uh, that does help you. So why not an abscess? Well, it's not an abscess because... Uh, I mean, it, it, it's a matter of semantics, what you call the post um inflammation. You know, some people argue that this is an infection from the attenuated bacilli that are instilled, but majority, because you never can isolate the bacilli from that, from these biopsies, majority feel that it's a hypersensitivity reaction. So to call it an abscess is sort of a misnomer in a sense. It's more post-inflammatory changes rather than an abscess. Um, so let's see, what, what pyrides would you ascribe to granulomatous prostatitis and would you follow? So that's actually a good question. If you are a purist, uh, and again, as a matter of reporting, what we would do is, uh, the way we would phrase it, we would say that this lesion shows restricted diffusion. Let's say the lesion did not show the peripheral ring enhancement, but there was a history of prior BCG installation. So then what you would do is you would say, while well, there is a you know large low bar area of restricted diffusion that uh, that uh, shows early enhancement given the prior history of um, uh, prior history of uh, BCG therapy. This likely represents granulomatous prostatitis, uh, although the lesion meets criteria for a pyrates five lesion. So they they know that you know despite you're calling it a pyrates five, they have to target it. If they get if it comes back as negative, they shouldn't be surprised as what they see this. Would it help if PSA density be routinely computed for all new cases encountered? Yes, I think uh, uh, that's part of our standard uh, reporting template. When we are reporting these cases, uh, we typically uh, always put the PSA density. And I told you the reasons for that because it does help you in your, uh, in your readout. What do you do with TZ ill-defined mixed or stromal by BPH looking tissue that has abnormal DDY? Do you ever uh, recommend follow-up? So again, this is a uh, a very common occurrence, and I'm glad somebody asked this question uh, because you know not everything is very clear cut as we lay it out in our pyrate schematics. When you see a, a fair number of cases, as we do, sometimes the BPH nodules don't follow the you know all the rules, and sometimes you may find one single area that is way more restricting than the rest of the uh, TZ, and no matter how many uh, which planes you look at you're not able to clearly define the capsule in its entirety so in that case you know we if you are ever in that dilemma we call it a pyrates 3 um, and we mark it uh, so that it's targeted uh, at the time of biopsy but we do indicate let's say in the body as i said earlier we will say well this does show restricted diffusion and appears to be asymmetrically more prominent than the rest we think that this may be an atypical bph so this way again when it comes back negative they know that this is not um, uh, not a uh, uh, you know not, not something that they should be worried about. The last case, uh, the one with the hemorrhage exclusions, and somebody wants a diagnosis. That was a, a it was a Gleason four plus three cancer on uh, sampling. Uh, I think pretty much I've covered most. Uh, is one point five Tesla enough or three T required? Um, you know that's a very uh, important question, and uh, perhaps the last one that I'll answer where. Um, 
I think all our patients are done on 3T and they are done without the coil. That's because of the spatial resolution and also for the temporal resolution on the enhanced images. If you do it on the 1.5, the problem is no matter how well uh, or how uh, good your phase array coils are, you still are at a loss of signal, especially with DWI. And in those cases, in order to truly get the value, you have to try and accentuate the signal with an endorectal coil, which is not ideal. So the only time we do 1.5T is when the patient has orthopedic hardware or there is a pacemaker or there is some other re reason where the 3T cannot be done. But for most other cases, our preference is to do 3T without a uh, endorectal coil. So I'll stop sharing and um, thank you again. And I don't know if um, there are any closing comments, but uh, thank you so much for your attention. And uh, it's a pleasure, was a pleasure presenting. Well, thank you so much for that awesome case review. That was incredible. And thank you so much for answering all those questions. Really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Take care, guys. Of course. Yeah. And thank you so much for everyone else for participating in this new conference and asking great questions. You can access the recording of today's conference and previous new conferences by creating a free MRI online account. We will also email out a link to the replay later today. Be sure to join us next week on Thursday, September 19th at 12 p.m. Eastern, where Dr. Jerry Barakos will deliver a lecture entitled The New Era of Alzheimer's Unlocking ARIA, Essential Insights for Radiologists in Alzheimer's Therapy. You can register for that at mrionline.com and follow us on social media for updates on future new conferences. Thanks again for learning with us and have a great day.